Hello, and welcome to Stuff TV. I'm your host, Nick Huzar. I'm also uh, the co-founder of OfferUp. Um, and over the years, I've watched billions of dollars in monthly transactions occurring off on OfferUp, and it's been wonderful to see all this secondhand you know, goods getting a second uh, home. Uh, but I also started to think a lot about my own existence and how it impacts the planet. And I've been scouring for a long time to try to uh, get answers, and I found it extremely hard. So this is kind of a personal journey for me with Steph TV is to find really interesting thought leaders, talk about this complex problem and see if we can make it simple and interesting to understand. Uh, so with that, I'm really excited. This is our eighth episode uh, and excited to have Nicole Kilner with us uh, to talk about her really interesting journey with artwork and how to communicate kind of what's happening there. So Nicole, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And yeah, we'd love to just hear more about your background. I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, yeah, so happy to share a bit about how I ended up making climate art. Um, so I started um, my first business when I was in college. Uh, I designed handbags. I basically like taught myself how to sew and got really hooked on kind of this little entrepreneurship journey. Um, and I fell in love with like that making process. Um, and it was definitely like a, one of the most creative times in my life. Um, but then like after college, I kind of lost touch with my creative side for quite some time. Uh, I ended up co-founding an after school program to teach kids how to code. And I loved that. I started like an all girls coding program within it. Um, and did that for several years. Uh, and we brought that to acquisition in 2019. And around like 2017, I uh, decided to do like a zero waste challenge for myself for a month. I was kind of doing this like minimalism year uh, and blogging about it and kind of just my own fun thing where every month I did a different theme around minimalism. And the zero waste month was the hardest by far. I was going to say, uh, how, how did you, <laughs> did you I chop like down a say, tree, go kill your own meat? <laughs> I, my, like, my favorite silly story was like, I think I spent like six hours on a Saturday cooking beans. Like I just like spent most of my free time figuring out how to feed myself was like the mm. theme of the month. <laughs> and, but like to do that, I did all this prep. And I learned a lot about kind of the state of our world and the climate crisis. And it just, I couldn't get it out of my head. And by the end of the month, I was like, I would like to work in this space. I was still doing the coding space at the time though. And then like fast forward to the acquisition. It's like, okay, I want to do climate, but I had no experience. And I was like, how do I get from A to Z? Like this is quite an intimidating path I want to go down. I, you know, you see all these incredible climate scientists in the space, or you see like really technical folks. And I just didn't feel like I had the chops and background to do that without going and getting a master's. And that wasn't the route that I wanted to do. Um, so I ended up getting really involved in a organization called My Climate Journey and listening to like all of the podcasts and mm -hmm. joining the Slack and um, just loved it and met my first boss, uh, in that space through like hosting these kind of little meetups that I would do, um, where I would kind of like bring together different members to speak on topics that they were experts on. Um, and so I met, um, my boss, Joel Armin Hoyland from Climate Finance Solutions there and became kind of his first hire as chief of staff and, uh, CFS is like a consulting for firm that helps companies secure non-dilutive funding, like grants to help scale climate solutions. Mm -hmm. So I kind of got my foot in the door because I had like the operations background to help in that space, even though I didn't have the climate background. And so you got to see a big, a wide swath of different types of companies addressing different types of issues, or was there yeah. a particular focus? He does a lot of work with like hard tech climate solutions. So like Charm Industrial is like one of um, their clients and yeah, like kind of, you know, things that can be eligible for large million and million dollar grants. So okay. uh, not necessarily like software, but more like, yeah, the hard tech solutions, which was really interesting. 
Um, and so from there I was working part-time with Joel and then I, uh, moved into a role at a startup called Dashboard Earth, um, which was like an app to help incentivize climate, uh, action through individual action. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was head of ops there. So like a lot of ops my whole career. Um, and around this time last year, I, you know, I was like, wow, I like did the thing. I like, <laughs> I'm now working at like a climate startup, the thing I wanted to be able to do. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but I was starting to feel like I wanted to maybe try to do something maybe a little more creative. Um, but once again, didn't really have any experience. And is this in the, heart of co in the heart of COVID? So you're home and... So I started working at Climate Finance Solutions during like COVID. Um, I kind of started my own like creative path towards working in climate right when COVID started. It was not ideal, but like MCJ was like for, it was the very beginning of my climate journey. There was like 400 members or whatever. So there was like an online community I could be a part of that was like starting to grow. Um, and so everything was virtual. I stayed at home with my parents during COVID and then I moved back to New York once like I was vaccinated and that's when I started to work full, full time. Um, yeah. So basically like I was in New York and Omicron hit last year and mm -hmm. I was like, okay, it feels like the beginning of COVID <laughs> again. Like I'm not going to leave my trapped apartment. Trapped in your apartment. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, it's winter. It's like, peak COVID vibes again. Like You're what am I going to do? Hibernation mode. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I have this idea. I'll just like paint a watercolor a day for a hundred days. And I like did a bunch of watercoloring during COVID to just kind of like relax myself and like lots of abstract stuff. Um, but I hadn't taken any like art classes since high school. Like it was just really a fun project. Uh, and I started posting on Twitter and basically like 10 days in, I posted about kelp and carbon sequestration and did this like fun little painting. And I, at the time I had about 400 followers and it got a hundred likes and I was like, wow, this is more <laughs> interactions than I've had combined since I started Twitter. Like I'll do the rest of my hundred days about climate. Um, and it just took off. I was growing by like a thousand followers a month and I was getting like client work out of nowhere. And I was, I basically fell in love with what I was doing and started making enough money that it seems like I could support myself as an artist within mm. four months. And I, I basically took a leap of faith and quit my job and have gone full-time on making climate arts. <laughs> that, that's amazing. Just an amazing story from, huh, I'm curious, right? You went there on this topic from curiosity, you know, you immersed yourself in it through these different experiences and just, you know, through the, maybe the, maybe it was great Omicron hit, right? Maybe we wouldn't even be chatting <laughs> if it didn't. And you started to get into this and started to see that people were really interested. What do you, when you first started posting, I mean, why do you think it started to resonate with people? Like, why, why were people all of a sudden attracted to what you were doing? Yeah, I think that there isn't a lot of, like, beautiful climate visualizations. I think that was, like, one thing. Like, a lot of the graphs that we look at are, like, black and white, straightforward about something, like, that's yeah, pretty... Scientific. <laughs> scientific and, like, not a positive thing that we want to be hearing about. Like, climate change is scary. And so seeing like a graph that's like black and white and doom and gloom, the combo just doesn't hook you. But since I started painting them in these really vibrant colors and kind of a playful manner, it was enough to have people like pause for a second and really consume it more than they might another black and white piece of painting. Um, and so I think there's one aspect of that. And then the paintings that I do, I try to focus on climate solutions more than fear. Sure. And so I think fear is a really like hope is a bigger motivator. And my goal is to really inspire climate action through art. And so it just started to resonate with folks. And I just received a lot of 
really great feedback. And I have also uh, listened to the people who like my art. And I'm always engaging with people, asking them to DM me with ideas. And I value their suggestions and then make them. So I think there's like that level of feeling like they're being listened to, which is kind of a special experience and fun. Yeah, I was looking at a, a few of the visuals you sent over. One is this ABCs of climate change. Yeah. You maybe just talk through a little bit of why did you decide those were the the interesting areas where, I mean, as you were maybe, maybe based on your background, you're already kind of seeing that there was some interesting innovations happening here. I'm just curious how that came to be your, that piece. So the ABC is one, I had an idea to do it and I thought it would be really fun because I do have kind of that education background and the simplicity, I just saw it as some way to break down climate into a really like basic, fun, sparking a conversation piece. And I didn't exactly think it would receive the amount of attention it did in the way that it did. Because when I posted it, some of the, everyone, <laughs> someone was like, she didn't really was bold thinking about posting something that had 26 different ways to evoke opinion. <laughs> and that was uh, something I didn't imagine. And it did receive a lot of different opinions. And I love that. Mm -hmm. And I ended up uh, doing a new version because there were so many great suggestions that I updated it. Like I took out hydrofluorocarbons and swapped it for hydro because um, that's a much more accessible thing that people yeah. can relate to. Yeah. Um, and so things like that. And I had in the first version, I had uh, there's like uh, methane and it has the cow uh, farting in the first version. Oh, yes. And then Twitter yes. was like, no, I want it burping because like both are technically true, but there yes. are way more emissions <laughs> from burping. And I just thought it looked way cuter. I didn't know I that. Like, hey, I learned something today. How I thought, yeah. farty is much yeah. cuter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, going back to climate change and the complexities of it, you know, you ask most people uh, over a certain age, or even my kids, they know that cow farting contributes to the ozone. But yeah. if you think of all the other ways, they probably don't know. Because it's such a simple, funny, entertaining kind of concept. Uh, but I, you know, I, I do think, you know, a lot of this is, is sometimes the observation I've had is it's scientific is very complex. And, you know, I was yesterday, I'm a mentor for uh, the creative destruction lab uh, organization. And there's a bunch of people working on climate change. And we had a big um, uh, meeting yesterday and there's like 16 companies presenting really amazing companies, scientists working on everything from, you know, carbon storage to, different types of fibers to, you know, different ways to absorb carbon out of the atmosphere. The hard part, of course, when you're a scientist, it's so easy for you. It's all it's what it is. Yeah. But then you communicate it to the masses and you're just eyes roll over. And so I think yeah. that's a big opportunity I see is great. I get what it does. Let's make it easy like a cow fart <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's pitch that. And so I, I, yeah. I think that's one of the biggest opportunities because I think Really, what you want people doing is you want them to have a conversation that's okay. interesting and engaging. But if it's too complex of a problem, it just people don't know where to start. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that I love working. I've worked with some like different kind, like different scientists, and I think there's just so much opportunity to have like the beginner's mindset and eyes that I do to then talk with climate scientists and help do that translation. Cause I think that's what we need more of. And I yeah. think that's what art is so great at. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of power in being able to kind of have that beginner's mind. And I felt the same way when I was running that after school program to teach kids how to code. I didn't come from a coding background. I learned how to code as I was teaching kids how to code. And mm -hmm. so that feeling of I know just as much as you do. Well, I, it was, I was always at least one step ahead, but enough that I could understand where they were at very easily and relate and empathize. And it's the same way for me when I'm painting about a lot of these things. I often think about them as my own like climate flashcards because when I was doing those 100 days, I <laughs> the day before, I often didn't know 
about the thing that I painted by the yeah. end of the next night at all. And so I had to become enough of an expert to be able to paint it, but not enough of an expert or like enough that I wouldn't get <laughs> hated on Twitter for yeah. and just enough that it was relevant and useful. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually think, cause I, I'm, I'm a sponge too. I wouldn't say, I don't know if there's anybody that's really a true expert in climate change. It's such a big yeah. encompassing thing, but I think I can observe complexity and make it simple. That's part of yeah. the motivation of even doing this channel is like, just yeah. how do we talk about this in a way that people can understand? And you and I were talking before uh, this podcast around other examples of this, which I think is kind of interesting. And, you know, I shared this story, I think, in a different podcast. Um, one was around the end of the Vietnam War. And most people don't know that what really ended the Vietnam War was two pictures. It was not the fact that millions of Vietnamese were dying or mm. you know, Americans were dying in the war. And, you know, there's, there's a, if you recall back then, there's a lot of history there that, you know, there was a lot of animosity and just very frustrated people around the country. And what ended the war was a picture of that naked girl running down the street with a bomb mm. going off in the background. And the other photo was the, the guy getting shot in the head. Oh and I think God. that was that was got so much momentum from the masses that created a lot of pressure on the government. And finally, we started to get out of there. Mm. Uh, I think the other one was the kind of the last straw movement. And so pe people that are familiar with that, um, there was in, in 2015, uh, there was a Texas a m graduate named Christine uh, Figuener, I think that's how you pronounce her name. And she went to Costa Rica and she saw a big sea turtle with a straw sticking out of its nose. And she was just so distraught by that because there's a lot of plastics in our ocean. Mm -hmm. And she took this picture that ultimately got enough um, momentum behind it with this turtle with a straw in its nose and had blood coming out. It was a very oh. little dis disturbing picture that that's what created this movement. So, you know, I think we all intuitively understand these things are problems. But when you can see it, I think that somehow affects people. You always say a picture is worth, worth a thousand words. And so I think there's a few examples kind of like, you know, so I've appreciated when we connected around painting and visualizing mm -hmm. and helping people to understand those, those kind of things. Yeah. And for me, like I, I made a book this year, it's like a coffee table book. And I really was trying to get away with not writing anything and calling myself an author, but I did because <laughs> it's all, it's basically 40 pages of my favorite art and then bound in a really beautiful book. But I made a preface because uh, my friends told me I needed to write one page. <laughs> and the thing that I open with is a quote that basically says the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. Mm. And that's kind of what I love to live by now, where I want to paint a future that we want to visualize and live in. And the book is called like A Brighter Future. Like that's whole, my whole vibe. Like mm. I those examples you shared are incredibly powerful, but also very disturbing. Like they're impactful and they have their own way of really shaping history. I personally can't do that kind of art, but the kind of art that I'm trying to do is the, you know, kind of this imagining vibe where we can see and hopefully get closer and see a beautiful world that we can be a part of um, and really show like that opposite side of the, the eco anxiety that we're often presented with. Cause we need, we need the hope to have enough. Like if we're just too scared and anxious all the time, we're going to be paralyzed and not be able to take any action. So yeah. I kind of like to, you know, create a little gap there to make that space possible to take action. Yeah, one of my ambitions, we'll see if I get there in 2023, 20, <laughs> is to make an interactive website. I mean, this is what I've been seeking. How can I go in there and make it very personal? How can I go in there and say, hey, and this is many years old. Here's how many T-shirts I have in my closet. Here's how often <laughs> I drive, right? Something interactive that's visual that helps mm -hmm. me to understand my impact on the planet. But there's, I have not found this on the web. So if anybody is watching this and fi finds an easy way to go do this, please let me know that. I think that's, I really am curious. And I think a lot of people are curious. There's just not any good tools or resources or anything that's really engaging to do that. Cause I could, I could see taking your artwork and having a very engaging website where you can play with different things and, and, and do yeah. things. And I think that's how people often learn. I was thinking of, um, 
back to kind of visual learning. I'm a very visual learner. Like, yeah, it's probably o- obvious. Uh, <laughs> in case and, that wasn't clear for yeah, me. Yeah, in case that wasn't clear. Yeah. Uh, uh, the and and so uh, I love reading. I'm just a slow reader. Yeah. Um, but if you show me a picture, I'm really I I just internalize it a lot better. And I was thinking about like kids and how they learn too. My my kids learned how to navigate an iPhone before they could even speak. It's and bonkers, right? I think that goes back to but the intuitive this of the of the interface. And we all we all at some point are visual learners. That's how we you know. And eventually we start reading. And you know, people go different routes. But I I just think that's really fascinating to to see kids interact, especially with technology now. They just mm-hmm. they can't even use they can't even form a sentence. And, you know, yeah. a lot of times I just give my kids my phone and I'm, I'm pretty technical, but they'll show me stuff. I don't, I don't even know. It's just cause it's like, it's like second nature to them. Yeah. And I think like, it's really wild. The way that we grow up and the way that we learn in classrooms when we're little, like art is such a big component. Like you might have a science class that you are making art related to the subject that you're learning. Like (laughs) this is my favorite memory of like kind of this example was when we were in, I think like seventh grade and we were learning about, you know, how mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Like that meme, we, my school had us make cakes about like how, like what is in a cell. And it was the coolest lesson where everyone came in with these epic cakes that are like, you know, cell shaped and then covered in like jelly beans or whatever. And like, represent the different parts and it's such a memorable tangible like tactile experience and like you're making art to do that and remember it like I remember that yeah and so we lose that when we grow up and I think I started doing these like art workshops about climate change for I'm an artist in residence for my climate journey now it has come full circle Mm. um and I do monthly climate art workshops for them and it is really nice to be able to take these topics that we're often talking about and reading about and add this physical element to them again, where we are feeling and, you know, translating knowledge into a physical representation. Um, and yeah, I think there that having more of that in our lives can only be good. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we need to waste. I, I always think I'm sure, you know, even at offer up, I probably drove a lot of people nuts because I have, I have a lot of very, I can just visualize the mosaic. Right. But if, you know, and then, but you, I need people around me, right. I need very uh, kind of quantitative folks because they help ground me and make sure the ideas are all there and they're all vetted. And I think yeah. um, that's a good balance. Right. But I think it's, I was reading this book on visualization the other day and just kind of uh and they talk a lot about this in school. Like I would, I wouldn't say I was an A plus student, but I would also say our educational system doesn't cater to how my brain thinks. Uh, I think yep. it just thinks in a different way, which is fine. But I think uh, when it comes out in the real world, you need this balance. You need the creative thinkers that can look at the systems and how they all interconnect at a macro level. You need the people that can quantify it and execute. You need, you need all those kind of folks. But I do think. It's, it's, you know, I would say my brain, you don't look, analyze my brain and say, oh yeah, this is perfect for academia because it's not. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, but I do think it's important to distill things down. And I think that was a gift. Like I think that Steve Jobs had very very much so. Uh, I had a uh, investor in my previous company that was the former COO at uh, Apple. And uh, he would, he was explaining like the, the, the talent of, of Steve Jobs where, Steve Jobs would literally go up to a whiteboard. He's like, yep, I hear all the complexity about this thing called an iPhone. And then he'd draw a rectangle with a circle on the bottom. He's like, yeah, fix, make it work with this. And then everyone in the room's like, no, how do you do this? Because in his mind, this is like dead simple, right? This is how you should interface with technology. And I think that was one of his like lifelong dreams is just take this complicated operating system and marry it with hardware and make it just this beautiful interface like this. And so it's yeah. pretty cool before he passed away that he was able to see it like, come actually turn into that. Uh, yeah. But I think he was very much a visual thinker uh, overall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was trying to think of other uh, visuals that could be interesting. I, I was thinking, uh, maybe going back to like, what, what drives inspiration for you? Is like, it, do people reach out and ask for you to paint something for them? I'm kind of curious on how, You've done a hundred of these now and now people kind of <laughs> commissioning, commissioning you to do work. Like, how does that come about? Yeah. Um, so all my clients pretty much slide into my DMs on Twitter, which is a funny, like, 
thing I would never have imagined my professional career to look like. Um, but yeah, so I, I get a lot of, you know, that's how most of my, my work looks like where they'll reach out. I work with like startups, VCs, nonprofits, government related organizations, things like that to help them kind of communicate any climate like branding, messaging, like whatever they need. If it's a report that they need a visual for or their website, social media, they kind of just tell me whatever they need and I figure out what that will look like. Um, and we collaborate on that and I love doing that. So I spend a good amount of my time working on client work, obviously. And then I try, now that I finished my 100 day challenge, I don't plan on doing one again in the <laughs> near future. It's, it's, because... like a, it's like a fitness challenge. You're like, to what, to what end? Yeah. <laughs> that was so much work. Oh my God. Uh, but I, my goal is usually to do one piece a week of my own like personal pleasure and put that out so that I'm kind of continuing to create new visuals and ideas and that kind of sparks conversations. And then I get more ideas and I try to do some like related to the news cycle or um, like topics that are particularly, you know, trendy in the climate conversation. Um, and I, you know, right now I'm doing a fun idea around making kind of climate, like it's some sort of like climate trading card game or a fun thing like that, where it's like almost like Pokemon style, but with like solar panels on it. Oh, or wind turbines Don't tell my, on tell, it. tell my son about this. He's a Pokemon <laughs> addict. I have to, cu- I have to cut him off. I mean, I, I tell him, I'm, I'm like, you got to stop this madness. He's, he can't stop spending uh, for Pokemon. He's got like so many books on that. I, I used to love Pokemon. So this is just like, why mm-hmm. not? Um, yeah. So I, I think it's, I'm at an interesting point right now where last year, I think those hundred days, I did a lot of like technical information and did a lot of like finding graphs and regurgitating that and like finding existing information and kind of like beautifying it or whatever. But this year I really, am like, even I'd say since like last August, I started really focusing on like cre- unique creation of art. If that makes sense. Um, which has really been so cool. Cause I have, I, you know, I don't work in a startup, but you can't take the startup out of me. I have a huge Trello board of all my ideas. Everything's very organized. Like, Mm -hmm. And so I have them categorized by the, all the like major sectors of, you know, energy, like, et cetera. And, but then I have one category that's just called fun and it's just me loose with silly ideas. And Mm. the, (laughs) I've really just been running through those and people seem to like them with these trading card ideas and, Um, that kind of example of a, the playfulness where I'm still communicating about climate, but it's not as like hard fact based. Um, and what really sparked this was if you look, uh, at the piece on slide three, the potential savings from the IRA. Um, so that painting I did right when the IRA came out and passed, um, the inflation reduction act. Um, and, Basically, I saw this massive <laughs> bill that had came out and it's all text. And yeah. I was like, this is incredible. There's like billion, like so much money. Like I can't remember the amount, it, but just like a bonkers amount of money that's going to climate. And I was like, this is huge, but there's nothing that's easily shareable or visual about it. And people aren't going to take the time and read this no. whole document. So I was like, all right, let's go. And I can you do this for for our board decks? You know, we have a hundred slide board decks. Can we just, can we condense it down to one? Like here it is. I got you. (laughs) Um, and it's like a 300 page document or something crazy, but I found a like democrats.gov like summary that was like 20 pages or something more doable. And then I found someone else who had started like a Google sheet that they were like open sourcing, kind of like sub breaking down some of the information. I found enough like partial summaries that I could get through Mm -hmm. and analyze myself. And I started to think of what a visual could look like that anyone would understand. And immediately I thought of a house and 
I saw it in my head and I was clear that I needed to have like a house with like each room breaking out all the different benefits that you can get when you start to, you know, electrify your home. And so I basically was able to sit down and paint that and was really proud of how it came out. And I posted it, I think it got like 4,000 likes or something nuts and it blew up and yeah. it, um, I think it, I think this piece got in the Washington Post, like climate newsletter or mm -hmm. something like that. And I started getting outreach or reached out to from local governments from different cities that were like, can I have this tailored to my city? And so I started customizing it to all sorts of organizations and cities. And it's just been really cool to start to make unique content like that, that just feels impactful. Like I'm able to collaborate with governments in that aspect and help individual citizens relate to this content. Like I, I sent it to my parents and they're like, wow, this is really great. Like we yeah. can get this amount off our, like an induction stove if we want or friends. And um, yeah, so that just felt really meaningful and the direction I want to move more towards. Yeah, I was, ex you know, I think, you know, to your point here, the, especially when you think about local, I was thinking about where does the trash go? <laughs> right. And everybody say, you know, well, not everybody, but a lot of people think, oh, I put things in the recycling bin. I feel good about that. Only 9% of what we recycle actually gets recycled. Mm -hmm. So it'd be, an, I don't know if you already have this or an interesting visual, but, but it's a very regional problem. So how mm. Seattle, uh, you know, gets rid of their waste versus where I live in Bellevue or New York or anywhere else. It's very different. And so I think, I do expect over time, like if we really want to put a good dent in climate change, we have to understand how to dispose of things, materials and waste mm -hmm. in a very different way. That happens locally. Manufacturing happens typically centrally. And then the way we get rid of it, you know, all happens locally. And I think government needs to play a bigger role in that too. But it's going to happen regionally and it's going to take time, probably in the scale of decades. But I think most people have no idea. Like I have yeah. no idea where all these all this trash goes. When I put yeah. it in, and I put it out, you know, the curb, it's out of sight, out of mind. So that's one. I think the other one is supply chains. That's a super complex one. Oh uh, yeah. We, we did an episode on that, uh, uh, last, uh, last week and just trying to wrap my head around just thinking through that because, you know, as a consumer, you know, you, you go to the store or Amazon sends you something, you use it and then you, you know, stick it in the trash or you donate it, mm -hmm. whatever. So you don't really think about the, the polls, right. Where it goes when you're, uh, when you're done, what it took to actually get it to you. Yeah. And so those could be some interesting ones. I've seen a few online around like the life cycle of a t-shirt. Um, yeah. I did one around composting. That was a, so it was a head of lettuce. It always cracks me up that like, this was during my hundred day challenge. And you know, some days are more detailed than others because it's a hundred days. And this was on my like, I'm really tired and I want to go see my friend tonight. So I'm just going to paint a head of lettuce and put some text on it. And so I painted it and um, basically it was saying that a head of lettuce takes 25 years to break down if it's put in landfill versus compost. Mm. And people were overwhelmed by that statistic, which is a bonkers one. And I had like two people reach out and say that they started composting because of it. That's awesome. And that alone, I'm like, wow, sure. I, I won. Yeah, <laughs> I made an impact. there and I won. <laughs> That's right. That's awesome. I had a friend of mine, we were snowboarding a few days ago, and we were actually talking about this kind of content. And he was saying they do core sampling of landfills. And some of these landfills have been around since the 50s. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, he, and he said, you can see, I mean, think of this. Like, we didn't have mass plastics in the 50s. Right. Wow, you know, not yeah. most consumers. So imagine watching this over the years and just taking a sample out and seeing how it's all evolved. Like you can actually see the evolution. I'm sure down at the bottom, you know, back way back then, a lot of it's probably like compost and everything. Yeah. Now, now you got so much plastic kind of probably like a, a layering, like a, and so I just, I never thought about like, that's how dense some of these landfills are that we have that no one can ever yeah. see. They're always out of sight, out of mind. You never know yeah. where they are. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I was curious on, on, I'm on your website, this, this Pantone art mm -hmm. that you did, maybe yeah. can you explain like what this represents? Yeah. Uh, those were just kind of a fun idea I had where I have them hanging on my wall right now. I, I think they're 
So there's one that's the climate stripes that represents, um, you know, global temperature change from 1850 to 1920. I can't remember the year it ends, 1950. Um, but uh, that so about, is about 100 years then you have. Yeah, there? That's the one know, I'm looking at. Yeah. Yeah. So is that the one you're looking at or is it the one that's like blue and green? No, it's that, that's okay. the one next. I'm looking at the one that, that goes from kind of blue okay. to red. Yeah. Yep. So that's like what was basically my, that was my first big viral piece. And that was actually before I even started my hundred day challenge. I tweeted it out uh, as an idea I had for my own personal Twitter header and um, I ended up resharing it when uh, I did my 100 day challenge because it took off way more then because I had people who were following me about climate. But basically, it shows temperature change. And it's a really, it's designed by Ed Hawkins. Um, he had the original data visualization. And I, you know, if, if you work in climate, you've seen that visualization around. And I basically, you know, turned it into a watercolor version. And I, it's like that, it, that print that I first did, I don't know if you can see it right now. It's like hanging on my wall right there. Yeah. Um, I have my book here too. So I've turned it into like my book oh, cool. cover. So it's like the, the thing that people know me the most about, um, kind of my little signature print. I turned it into a dress and a jacket. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So I yeah, I, that piece I, a lot. you know, the thing that, I was, I think a lot about this, this topic that one of the reasons we should pay a lot more attention than we ever have is we just have a lot more data. If you go back to even when I was a kid, I feel like everybody, you know, people are environmentally, they talk about the environment said, Oh, you know, we got to think about this, but we didn't have a whole lot of data yet. Like we had yeah. some data and I think Carl Sagan, you know, he's, he used to talk a lot about this. Yeah. But, you know, we now we have decades and decades of data. Satellites have been analyzing the planet for a long time and you used to have a lot of people that say, oh, yeah, we global warming. It's not a, it's not a thing because the, the earth heats and cools, heats and cools. Yeah, um, that's true throughout the year somewhat. But if you go back to a longer period of time, you can see that we definitely have a heating cycle and, and you know, maybe not a cycle like it's it's like up and to the right. Right. There's, mm -hmm. this, there's this really good chart that shows kind of CO2 over I, even going back 800,000 years and the last 75 years. It's like, you know, it's, and, and, and from a venture capitalist standpoint, it's the curve you want to see <laughs> up and to the right. Uh, not great. Sick. Yeah, not, not great for humans. And, <clears throat> and, and, you know, like, well, well, why did that happen? It's 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 really the amount of CO2 that we're putting out yeah. there. And it's creating this this war, this really rapid warming of the planet. And you can see that in just all the. um natural occurrences. I think the other son, sometimes uh, misnomer around climate change with global warming is, oh, everything just gets hotter. That's not true. Uh, it's, it creates yeah. more ex extremes, right? So yeah. you get you get mass flooding and mass cooling or mm -hmm. the exact opposite where it gets super hot. And we're breaking yeah. records. We break records every year now. Right? Every year yeah. we're breaking records of the, oh, you know, Death Valley is now hotter than it's ever been. And and, uh, and so to what end? And I, I think you know, I'm optimistic that if people continue to talk and come together, that we'll make change faster. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's just my view is, yeah, I think there's a lot of people making change. It's just not fast enough. Like we haven't bent the curve yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the yeah. curve's still just skyrocketing up. <laughs> <laughs> not what we want to be seeing. <laughs> if anyone wants to get in touch with me, I'm like, you can just shoot me a DM on Twitter. I'm at Nicole Keltner. Um, yeah, I'm... I answer pretty much everyone. So that's my thing. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Nicole, for being here and really think, you know, I think it's somewhat, you know, sometimes in life you, you pursue something and to see what it turns into. And I think your story is just really fascinating. I, I think it's awesome. You're working on such an important topic and making it easy for everyone to, to digest. So appreciate you for being here. Thank you.